Hallelujah. Like I said before, it's good to be in the house of God once again. I, um, you know, we, uh, we had little Levi uh, 11 days ago, and um, I'm having more fun with him on the outside than I was on the inside. Uh, <laughs> pregnancy does not sit well with me, but we're so thankful that God has blessed us with a, a, a beautiful, healthy baby boy. And, uh, but I, I desperately missed being here last Sunday. Uh, I needed the rest and I needed to heal, but I am so thankful to be back in the house of God. Um, you know, coming, no matter what it is that we're going through, all of us are, if you're living for the Lord, you're in a trial. You're either in a trial or you just left a trial or you're on your way into one. It's, if you're really living for him, it's not all going to be easy. It's not all roses. There's thorns on the roses, so to speak. Um, and so today when I began to seek the Lord, my husband didn't give me, uh, he, one thing he's been teaching me through the years is be in, in season and out. So he kind of sprung it on me this afternoon. And as I began to seek the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to minister tonight? Uh, what came, what popped in my heart was trust in the Lord. And never, never has there been a time more when the body of Christ needs to learn, needs to know how to trust in the Lord. The first thing that we should be able to do whenever we're wanting to trust in the Lord is realize, I don't know how to do that. So I said to the Lord, when I heard trust in the Lord, I said, okay, tell me how. Show me. And uh, he took me to Proverbs, so we're going to open up at Proverbs chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 5. You know what? We're going to start in verse 1. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall, be, shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them upon the, the table of thine heart, so shalt thou fa find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil." It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of thine increase. And I already gave you the title of the message, but I'm going to minister just for a few minutes tonight. Trust in the Lord. Heavenly Father, anoint my lips, Lord God, to share your word, to deliver the truth, Lord, as your Holy Spirit would see fit. Lord, that you would... Speak to the hearts of your people, Lord God, that your word would be sown not into any old ground, but into good ground, that it might bring forth fruit unto your kingdom, Lord, that, that you would be glorified in each and every heart, in each and every life. We praise you and we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. You know, as I began to seek the Lord, okay, well, <laughs> trust in the Lord, show me. This was really the first scriptures I came to in trusting in the Lord is, you know, he says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding. We like to quote that trust in the Lord with all your heart, but that lean not to your own understanding part is necessary. You know, uh, the thing that I, the reason why I began in verse one is he's talking about forget not your law, my law. Well, we can't, that's, that's the Ten Commandments, we can't do the Ten Commandments. But Christ came to fulfill those. So our faith would not be in our ability to keep the, the commandments or to know the commandments, but rather that we would have our faith in the commandment keeper, which is Christ. And if our faith is in the right place, it brings us what? Verse 2 says, length of days, a long life, and peace shall be added to you. He says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. It's interesting that he uses those words because we need his mercy. 
that's the very definition, if you will, of what grace would be. I need his mercy, and I need his truth. Those two go hand in hand. You can't have his, experience his grace without mercy. We, we don't have in and of ourselves to, what we need to be able to even approach God. We've got to have his grace, and that comes by his mercy. He's merciful. He's, he's having relationship with an undeserving people. That's that doctrine of total depravity we're always hammering on here is we need that. We need his mercy. We need his grace. And his truth is what gets us going down the right road. Something that we can come across, we can come across fact. A lot of people, a lot of Christians confuse fact and truth. It's a fact that I'm wearing a colorful shirt. That's a fact. Is it truth? No. It's not truth. It's a fact. Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We just sang a song about the blood, about Jesus being the blood. In John 10 and 10, and this isn't in my notes, but in John 10 and 10, he spoke about that blood being applied to the door. The only way that we can come to God is through the door. It has to have the blood applied. Once again, leading credence to Christ and what he's done at the cross for us. It always has to begin with that. The sacrifice. that What he's done on our behalf. Trusting in the Lord begins with understanding the right place, the right way to trust in the Lord. A lot of people say, I'm trusting in the Lord, but they don't have an understanding of what it is he's done at the cross. Many people think because they've heard, if you live in America, you've heard about Christ going to the cross. You've heard it. You, it's, it's scant people, very few that I, have, I, I would meet would say they've never heard of Jesus, they've never heard the name Jesus Christ, and they've never heard of the cross in America. What's sad is most people have heard of this, and yet they still don't know how to approach God. They still are trying to rely on their merits. They're trying to rely on their thought process. In verse 5, once again, it's interesting. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not just some of your heart, but all of your heart. Uh, how, how many of us just kind of half-baked do things sometimes? You know, uh, maybe we're just trying to get through. Um, trusting in him with all your heart, is the, it, it speaks of a desperation. Um, uh, Lord, I'm absolutely lost without your help. I'm desperate for you. When's the last time that we were desperate for God in that manner? That he was the literal air that we breathe. That his word was literally food for our soul. That it was what directed our path. Uh, we've got to have a dependence upon him that way. Um, you know, sweet baby Levi, 11 days old, is completely dependent upon us. He's a picture of a child of God living for the Lord. You know, as he was in my stomach, he's got that umbilical cord, that little nasty thing just fell off today. <laughs> but when you, when you come to Christ, it's like it's connected. You go from living for yourself and, and directing yourself to it's connected and I'm solely dependent upon him. And the Bible says that we're not our own. We're bought with his blood. We're bought with a price. That means that the direction that we would take in our lives, it's got to be led by him. And the way that we think, our thought process is always wrong. Um, I've, I used to hear uh, people say all the time, you know, listen to your heart, follow your heart. Jeremiah says that the heart is desperately wicked. It's deceitful and desperately wicked above all things who can know it. That tells you right there, and that's just one scripture, but that tells you right there, no, my heart can't be trusted. I can't trust in my feelings. I can't trust in my heart. I can't trust in man, what other people say, and we'll get to that. But trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. That is a part we struggle with, isn't it? The lean not to your own understanding because when the trial hits, when the struggle comes, the first thing we try to do is reason within ourselves. How can I fix this? Your back's against the wall. You're going to be evicted. 
or your car is going to be repoed, or your marriage is on the rocks, or you fill in the blank, whatever it is, whatever the struggle is, you try to figure out. It's our natural inclination. That's that depraved nature. It's our natural inclination to try to get in there and fix it. I'm going to be talking about Levi. I apologize. But I've noticed, and I used this as I was talking with somebody this week, you know, um, when I'm trying to feed him, he's got this thing. He's hungry, so he's trying to stick his fingers in his mouth, and I'm trying to put the bottle in his mouth. And his fingers don't have nutrients, but the bottle does. And I'm like, son, if you'll just get out of the way, I can give you what you need. And, and that's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to get out of the way. A lot of times those trials that we're going through and the struggles we're going through, he's trying to teach us in the midst of it when we're failing, when we're struggling, when life's not going the way that we think it should. He's trying to show us you're not sufficient, but I am. Get out of the way so I can give you what you need. He knows what we have a need of. He has not forgotten us. I know every person that's in this room, everybody by radio, everybody by TV, you've got something going on in your life, something you're struggling with. There's things I'm struggling with, and I'm having to, to trust in the Lord. I had to, I'm eating of this as, as, as it's being preached. I'm eating of it. You know, we don't come back here and, and stand up with a mic to give you our opinions or to, uh, to look down our nose and try to preach something we're not learning ourselves. We're eating of it too. We're Christian first, then ministers. But we're learning just as, as any, anybody else is. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That means in all your ways, acknowledging, I can't do it. But I'm looking to you. In all that child's ways, both of my kids, they're dependent on me and my, and my husband. They're dependent on us. They're acknowledging, I need your help. When Nathan doesn't know how to do something, he, he's able to admit, Mama, I, I need some help. That's exactly, that's what faith is, my husband just said. You know, uh, and then it says, he will direct your path. See, we want to know, God, which way? do I go? When you're on the potter's wheel, all you can tell sometimes is it's spinning. My life is spinning out of control. I can't see to walk straight. I don't know what's going on, Lord. What are you doing? I can't even, if I had a nickel for every time that I've asked the Lord that, that I've, I've felt like I have no idea what's going on in my life right now. I really could use a little bit of insight. And his answer is right here. It's in his word. It's always in his word. It's always in, that's why I said something about having that desperation. He's, if you seek him with your whole heart, you're going to find him. If you're desperate for the answer from him, not man, not your opinion, not your own thought process, not your own leading, but if you're desperate to actually know what the will of the Lord is, laying aside what you want, He'll lead you and direct your, direct your path. Let's go to Proverbs 28, verse 25. 28, verse 25. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. I don't think he's meaning fat like Gordo fat. He's meaning... You're going to be satisfied. You're going to be full. You know, it's pride that keeps us from really receiving the true goodness of God. Everything that Christ has paid for and purchased for us, it's pride. It's our, our trust in our knowledge, our, our trust in self, our trust in our ability to accomplish anything. Um, it's pride. If there are struggles that you're having and you feel like there's a roadblock, it's good to ask the Lord, Lord, what is it that's getting in the way? A lot of times it's pride. Anytime that we're trusting in self, whether it's psychology, whether it's 40 days of purpose, whether it's you fill in the blank, whatever it is, whatever you're trusting in other than faith alone and what he's done is going to be trust in self. That's pride. And the Bible says God hates a 
proud look. We got some Brians in here. He hates a proud look. He doesn't, it's, it's better to come to him as a child and say, I don't know how to trust you. I don't know what to do. He loves that. He's like, you know, there's nothing more that I love more than when my son is able to admit to me, Mama, I need some help. I'm more than happy to get in there and help him. You know, it's the, the thinking I know. I already know what I'm doing. I got this. Because you watch him struggle. As a parent, you watch them struggle. As a pastor, you watch people struggle. And you wish you could get in there and you wish you could fix it. You wish you could lead them or tell them. And you realize that they've got to figure it out on their own, just like you did, just like we do. It, it's Living for the Lord is not always the easiest. Trusting in him is not always easiest. My husband mentioned it this morning when he talked about fighting the good fight of faith. You would think that would be easy. Just believe. That's the work. Matthew 6 and 29. To believe on what it is he has done. To believe on him. That seems simple. And there is simplicity in Christ. And yet, we're just like the baby. Trying to put our fingers, trying to get in there. trying to, And we don't have what we need in order to accomplish what needs to be done. Does that make sense? Uh, Proverbs 29 verse 25 and 26. So just the next book over. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Many seek the ruler's favor, but every man's judgment cometh, cometh from the Lord. It's whenever we're seeking to trust in the Lord, it seems like it would be common sense to, to say, I would go to the Lord, right? That sounds like common sense, but I'm finding these days that common sense isn't so common. The, the simple things we tend to overcomplicate. So what seems like it's simple isn't always so. We, we tend to, to make things harder than they really are. What I did is I just went through, Lord, show me in your word. Trust in the Lord. I looked up the phrase. I'm giving you scriptures where I looked up the phrase. Psalm 118, verse 5. Sometimes we just need to get in the word, and we just need to ask the Lord, read the scriptures, and let him speak to our hearts. Because it doesn't have to have some great expounding. It doesn't have to have some great, he gives you what you need. Psalm 118, verse 5. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations compass me about, but in the name of the Lord I, will I destroy them. Is he going to destroy it? No. He said, in the name of the Lord. Meaning the Lord has already done that at the cross. He's already destroyed your enemies. Whatever your struggle is, if it's your boss, if it's a coworker, if it's your spouse, if it's your sibling, if it's your parents, whatever it is, again, you fill in the blank. He has made a way. It's through what he's done at the cross and faith. I've had people say to me, you know, uh, someone that was single once was saying, well, how? How do I do that? Keep sitting under this message. Keep sitting under this message. What we're doing here is we're rightly dividing the word of truth. We're telling you the truth is you can't do it on your own, but Christ already has. It's that simple. Again, simplicity in Christ. He's done it. We can't. We can't. He did it. And in the, the, the growing in the knowledge and the understanding of that is where we learn how to trust in the Lord. It's a journey. Those trials that you're going through, it's not, it's not happenstance. God, there's nothing that can come upon us that he doesn't allow. Does that make him evil because you're going through a struggle or a trial or something bad happened? Absolutely not. 
But what he's doing is he's trying, in those trials, you'll realize when the heat gets turned up in the fire, the refiner's fire, and the dross begins to come to the top, it's all of that unwanted stuff, all of the, I had my faith in this, I had my faith in that. I'll give you an example. Trusting in the Lord is not always easy. You know, most of y'all have already heard this, but for those that haven't, five years ago, I gave birth to a little girl, Hannah, and at six weeks old, she passed away. That was devastating for us. I've lost parents, I've lost family members, I've lost best friends, aunts, grandmothers, all of which I was extremely close to, but losing my child, I wanted to die. That is a pain that I wish upon no one. And after about a year, I had baby fever. I wanted, I wanted a child so desperately. What I didn't realize was, and I'm glad God didn't give me what I wanted when I wanted it, because what I was looking for was a replacement. But in my heart, I didn't know that. I wanted another child, and I begged God for that. But I would have had the wrong focus if he would have given me what I wanted and what I asked for then. And I learned in the midst of not receiving what it was I wanted that he had other plans. And I learned to trust him. And eventually, after about a year, two years, I think it was, I finally just gave up and said, you know what? I don't want any more kids. I was saying it, but my heart hadn't lined up with it. As time went by, I got to where four years went by. And I realized, you know what? I'm good. And I really, in my heart, meant it. Like, I'm happy with just Nathan. I'm, just, I'm happy with, with having him. We've got our ministries. We're busy. I don't have time for another kid. I like my sleep. <laughs> and about the time that I was announcing to everyone, no, we're good. We're not having any more kids. I found out I was pregnant with Levi. And that's about how it goes. You know, we have these desires in our heart, and yes, God will give you the desires of your heart, but are we seeking his will? Are we really trusting in him, or do we just want what we want? I didn't know when Levi came along, and that was a torturous, if you've been watching and you've been a part and you've been listening to our prayer requests, I've been on the list forever, I'm finally off, thank God, but it was a miserable, miserable pregnancy. Um, it was very, very difficult for me to carry him, and I was sick all the time. I was on five different medications. Uh, just to hear that I had a healthy baby boy was such good news because we'd lost Hannah. She was born with a genetic disorder. Um, having to trust the Lord through that pregnancy. Here's this child being born in secret. I can't see him. I don't know. Is he healthy? I go to the doctors, and they're doing some of the testing, and I'm high risk because I'm above 35. And, uh, and because we've had a child die from a genetic disorder, I had to go to a genetic counselor, had to do all of this stuff. And when it came down to it, and they wanted to check this, and they wanted to check this and test for this, eventually my husband and I discussed it, and eventually we got to the place where we realized, you know what? We're going to trust God. No, I'm not going to do the AMEO. I don't want to know if it's a Down syndrome baby. What good is it going to do for me to know that now in the middle of the pregnancy when I've the last, the worst thing that could have happened has already happened. We lost a child. So whatever we deal with when it gets here, we'll deal with it then. But trusting the Lord in the midst of that trial as the sickness is going on, as I'm taking five different medications. And I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people I don't like not that I'm against doctors, but I don't like medication. I don't want to take it if I don't have to, and I don't think anybody really loves it, but um, I actually would used to judge people that would take like a CPAC for a bacterial infection or something while pregnant and think, why would you let a doctor do that? And here I was, I had to take two. I had to take asthma medicine. I had to take two different kinds of nausea medicine. I had to take reflux medicine. I couldn't function without it. It was miserable. And what I realized in the midst of that is trusting in the Lord. It becomes real. It's not just this figment of your imagination. You're learning how to trust him. You're learning to rely on that word. You're learning to come to him in desperation and say, God, I don't have the answer. 
And even if the outcome is not what I want, even if the outcome is the worst case scenario, I'm going to trust you. And I had to be at that place where coming to the end of the pregnancy, fear would try to come upon me. You're not going to have a healthy kid. You're going to lose this one too. This one's going to be sick. You're going to be in the hospital all the time with a sick kid. And I had to cast those down, not that I could on my own. I had to yield to the Lord and say, you know, Lord, this is too big for me. I can't handle this. And so many times we don't get to that place. We, the, the trial continues. It continues. It intensifies. And what we're doing is we're still trying to hang on to some sort of answer. When all he's trying to do is get you to let go. My husband said it well this morning when he preached about Moses, where he sat upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and he lifted his hands. That's when they prevailed. It's a sign of surrender. Surrendering to the Lord. Let me just get back to the word here. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. That word trust means to have confidence to be secure, to hope in. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Verses 8 and 9, this word confidence is the same thing as that word trust. That I just, that when you look at the, at the Hebrew, the original word, it's the same. But there's another place in the Psalms where that word trust means refuge. With whatever it is that we're going through, whether it be stuff that happened in your past or things that you're experiencing now, struggles that you're having now, the Lord has to become, needs to become your hiding place. He needs to become that safe place that you can dwell. He's created this sphere in Christ Jesus. And if you're born again and you've given your heart to him, and I'm not talking about water baptism, you were dunked in water, or you made a profession at 10 years old. I'm talking about you received what Christ did for you. You've had your faith in it. And as Colossians 2 and 6 says, as you have received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. Meaning the same way you got saved is the same way you live for God. So if I put my faith in Christ and what he had done to become saved, then it stands to reason that I've got to have my faith in the same thing to get me through this trial. To change my mind, to think like him. To sanctify me. When that trial happens in that thing, that, that mournful dross, that when the toothpaste is squeezed, what comes out of me? That temper or that foul mouth or that running to secular movies or secular music or whatever your escape might be, beer, whatever it is, and you fill in the blank. It can be anything. What are we trusting in? Are you trusting in the Lord? Or are you trusting in that thing? I remember when I used to smoke cigarettes. I smoked two packs a day. I did that for almost 15 years. And I remember getting to the point where I realized this thing has me. I'd go to a movie. I'd be in the movie 30 minutes. And I would want that cigarette so bad. I couldn't even think about the movie because I was thinking about the cigarette. And what bothered me most was realizing this thing has control of me. And I got to the place where I realized I'm trusting in this rather than trusting in the Lord. And I went to the Lord, and, and one time I had quit for like a year on my own. I had quit, just laid them down. But I still dreamed about them. I still craved them. When I sat down with somebody that we'd finish eating and they'd light up a cigarette, I'd smell it, and I wanted one. But when I asked the Lord to deliver me, when I realized, I acquiesced, and I lifted my hands, and I said, Lord, I can't do it. This thing has a hold of me, and I don't have what it takes to stop this. I need your help. He stepped in. It's as though I've never smoked. I don't desire it. I don't want it. Uh, I don't feel like I ever have smoked, although I know I did. There's power in the blood, exactly. There's, he, he has a way, but what are we trusting in? We've got to ask ourselves, because we're, we're in those end times now where those things, we're constantly in this ministry, we're trying to expose those things. If it's, 
if it's uh, 40 days of purpose, we're trying to expose it. If it's government of 12, we're trying to expose it. Not because we want to say they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong, we're right. What we're trying to say is that way will lead you the wrong way. That way will lead you the wrong way. We're concerned for your souls. We love you. We want you to go the right way because we've been anything that's, that's other than what Christ has done and putting your faith in what he has done alone is going to be an end that you can't handle. It's too much for you. It's a burden that's too heavy. If you're not sitting under a ministry that is preaching this message exclusively, they are, you're perishing. You're dying daily, spiritually. You're dying. What they're feeding you is poison. I tell you that because I love you. That what they're feeding you is poison. Not that, again, not that we're trying to say how great we are. But we care for your soul. And if it's going to, to hinder you, then we want you to know it. Let me see if I can wrap this up. Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4. Thou wilt keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. When we trust in him, he's our strength. Not just our strength, he's everlasting strength. That's forever strength. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in, salt, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. Did you notice that the Lord is the hope? For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat comes. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. There's fruitfulness that takes place when your faith is in the right thing. We can't be fruitful. Christ said it in John 15 and 5. He said, without me, you can do no thing. Now, he's talking about being the vine, and I think I've ministered on that a few months back, about fruitfulness. Trusting in the Lord brings fruitfulness. That means in a drought, in a time when you should not prosper, in a time when you should not be blessed, you will. Now, it's not always that that physical blessing. It's not always the Pony or the, the, the Cadillac or the, the Lexus. Sometimes it's just the plain old Pontiac. Sometimes it's, it's what God will do is he'll bless in a different way. It's not always monetary, like these word of faith and prosperity preachers preach. So we've talked about trusting in the Lord We've talked about trials, trusting in the Lord. We've talked about how the message of the cross, what Christ has done for us, and our faith exclusively in that. Again, I apologize for the kid thing, but I've, I'm friends with a lot of women. We kind of went through the pregnancy together uh, in a group on Facebook, and a lot of them are talking about exclusive breastfeeding. Not here to talk about breastfeeding, but exclusively meaning that's all they're doing. They're not feeding them formula. They're not supplementing anything else exclusively. When we say believing in what Christ has done exclusively, we're talking about not being fed anything else. We're talking about just eating the good meat of the word, which is what Christ has done on our behalf. There's fruitfulness. There's peace. That's what we've been seeing. He's our hiding place. We can hide in him. There's a place to run to. This world is evil, and it's darkness, and it's a struggle. We have a great hiding place in him. Now, with that said, I'm going to finish Matthew 27, verse 43. 
Now, this is where Christ has been taken to the cross, and he's been crucified. He's up on the cross, and those that were mocking him, we'll go to 41. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. That's the evil heart of man, folks. Each and every one of us are like that. The blood is offensive. Whether we want to believe it or not, our automatic default is Cain's way. I can do it. I can get my hands involved. My way is better. My... And God says, the sin offering lies at the door. I won't accept anything other than what my son has done. Behold, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He didn't say, this is my daughter. This is, this is April. This is Justin. This is Sherry. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So if you're not in Christ, you're not, God's not pleased with you. If your faith has not been in and is not in what Christ has done and that exclusively, supplementing nothing else then he's not pleased with you because he's not looking at you he's looking at the sacrifice that's brought he's looking at what are you trusting in what my son's already done for everything that you have need of that blood-stained banner or self again God hates a proud look so here he is Christ is up on the cross and these Chief priests, the religious, they're mocking him and they're saying, look, he saved others. Come down from the cross. The wicked heart of man wants to exclude the cross always. And yet that's what God has made as the way. Verse 43, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he, he said, I am the son of God. They, they couldn't believe that the king of glory would go to a cross and hang there. And little did they know, and we talked about this when Easter came around, that word Easter is an unfortunate translation. It really means Passover, which leans credence to the worship song we sang earlier, talking about the lamb, talking about the blood. When the blood is applied, the death angel passes over. When blood's not applied, when your faith is not in what Christ is, and, and has done and that alone, then death is going to come upon you spiritual death physical death it's going to be nothing but a downward spiral it's not always immediate it's usually like that that proverbial pot of boiling water with the frog in it as the heat by the time the frog realizes he's boiled to death it's too late we're in those days we're in those days where all of these other methods that are not exclusive. All of the supplementation for your nutrients is damaging. It's killing you. It's poisoning you. Again, I tell you that because I love you. So our faith needs to be in what he has done. And it, it doesn't seem, your reasoning wouldn't automatically be just as theirs wasn't. That what Christ has done in that alone, him up on the cross, the king of glory being crucified. Surely that wouldn't be the answer, Right? Surely that's too simple. And yet him being the author of life,